tonight. You are concerned about our country and you love God and you love the word of God and you want to make sure that you're encouraged to be able to face the challenges of what's going on in our country. And I want to begin, first of all, by documenting the increased hostility toward God and the Bible that is going on in our nation. And I think that it's going to be unpleasant at the beginning, but I want to end on a positive note. I've been for the last year clipping from news reports, stories that show how uh, the Christian system or the belief in God and the Bible is being more and more under attack. Of course, you've heard of Walter Reed Military Medical Center and there was a September 14th memo that went out uh, last year and during 2012 that covers guidelines for the wounded, the ill, the injured, partners in care. And this is what that memo said, quote, no religious items, that is Bibles, reading material and or artifacts are allowed to be given away or used during a visit. The people were told that they would not be allowed to bring a Bible into the hospital to give to the soldiers who were there, who were wounded. They were told that they would not be allowed to read from the Bible to those who were in their hospital beds. In fact, the explanation was given. You can't bring in a Bible and read from it when you visit your son or your daughter, perhaps your wife or your husband. And uh, when this became a matter of uproar, uh, an announcement came forth that said, oh, well, that was an accident. That memo should never have been sent. But then again, you read of stories like this where a female army chaplain is now recently come forward and she tells conservative commentator Todd, uh, Todd Starnes that she was reprimanded for posting a message on her personal Facebook page. This was not related to her government work or her army work. This was on her personal Facebook page. And in that particular post, she says that homosexuality is a sin. And she spoke out against preachers who would support same-sex relationships. And she was called on the carpet for it and told that she was hostile and antagonistic. And she was told you can either take that message off your personal Facebook page or we'll dock you in rank and pay. You're not allowed to express that on your post. She refused to take it down. As you think about the matter of the public schools, I'm more and more concerned about what's going on in our public schools as far as what's going on now close to us in Canada. A high school student was suspended for a week, suspended from school for a week because he wore a t-shirt which said, Life is wasted without Jesus. That was considered to be such an egregious crime that he was told he had to miss school for a week. Uh, this was uh, suggested to be hate speech. In fact, they told him, your shirt implies that if someone is not living for Jesus, they've wasted their lives. And so you are not allowed to wear that shirt here ever again and you are suspended for one week. They told him, if your shirt had said, my life is enhanced with Jesus, you could have worn it. But your shirt says life is wasted without Jesus, and that makes all the people that don't believe in Jesus feel bad, and that hurts their feelings, so you're kicked out of school for a week. I'd like to tell you that that's not happening in the United States of America in any way, shape, or form. But uh, I'm afraid the evidence is just too strong. I want you to consider there is a San Antonio proposal in San Antonio, Texas that could bar anyone that believes in Jesus Christ as the Son of God and who believes that homosexuality is sinful. There is a proposal, it's not been passed, but there was a proposal uh, that this should bar someone from serving on the city council. And this is what the, the statement was made. It should add sexual orientation and gender identity to the city's discrimination ordinance. It would protect gays, lesbians, transgenders, and veterans. 
No person shall be appointed to a position if the city council finds that such person has, prior to their proposed appointment, engaged in discrimination or demonstrated a bias by word or deed against any person, group, or organization on the basis of race, color, religion, national origin, sex, sexual orientation, gender identity, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So the idea is if you believe that homosexuality is a sin, you are not fit for public office because you couldn't possibly represent people very well believing that. There is a woman who's under investigation as a school teacher. New Jersey Governor Chris Christie uh, said that her statement on her Facebook page was disturbing to him. He, what did she say? She said on her Facebook page that she opposed homosexuality because of her Christian faith. And she said that homosexuality is a sin and that it spreads like cancer if we don't stop it and that it is perverted. And so she was told by her high school that had recently put out a display in the high school emphasizing lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender history month. And they had pictures of actor Neil Patrick Harris. They had pictures of Harvey Milk and Virginia Woolf. And they said the district's taking this matter very seriously. She has condemned a group of people and the Board of Education is going to act appropriately based on the outcome of the investigation. And so she's in trouble because on her private Facebook page, she has said homosexuality is a sin. Now I want you to notice that in New Mexico, there has been a ruling that gay rights trump your rights as a believer in the Bible and its moral standards. There's a photographer in New Mexico that has been told you cannot refuse to take pictures of a same-sex wedding or same-sex civil union or same-sex ceremony. You're not allowed to refuse that because that would make you guilty of discrimination. This uh, photography business, Elaine Photography, uh, they tried to be, hire them in 2006 for a same gender ceremony and the lady refused on the grounds that it uh, violated what she and her husband believed religiously. And so this person then sued them and took them to court because they had the audacity to say, we don't want to take pictures of your gay wedding or your gay ceremony. It's not actually officially authorized in New Mexico yet. There are places, for example, in London, England, an American preacher, I uh, don't know what religious group he represented, but an American preacher was uh, arrested recently on the streets of London because he was preaching out loud that homosexuality is a sin. Now, he said when he was interviewed by the police that that's not the only thing that he had uh, criticized or condemned. He had also criticized uh, sexual relations without marriage and fornication and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But they arrested him because a woman who was offended by a statement went and got her camera. She started filming him. She took it to the police. They came and arrested him and told him he's not allowed to preach that anymore. Now, our president, and I will say later in this message how we ought to show respect for the office, but we can disagree with the person in the office on some stance that they take. I've done that, by the way, all my preaching life. I didn't start doing this just a year or so ago or a few years ago. I've always done that, and it never mattered to me what party this person was, what race this person was. Nothing ever mattered to me except whether it was right or wrong, and so I'm not doing anything different than I've ever done here. I simply want you to notice that the statement is made by President Obama when he was running for re-election. He said this, quote, we have never gone wrong when we expanded rights and responsibilities to everybody. That does not weaken families, that strengthens families, he claimed. To allow people to get married who are the same gender will not weaken the family, it will strengthen the family. And he spoke before a, an audience of gay and lesbian supporters in New York Openly gay singer Ricky Martin was there, as well as a Latino group, the Futuro Fund. And his comments at this fundraiser 
were to announce his support for gay marriage in a very open way. And so we continue to look on and notice that we're facing some challenges. Now, I want to just very briefly tell you that I could go on and on with this, but I want to tell you a couple of other things that will really uh, jolt you perhaps. We have a homeowner in Phoenix, Arizona, who was arrested. What was his crime? What was his crime? He was hosting a Bible study in the privacy of his home. He was sentenced to 60 days in jail. 60 days. Now, he was found guilty in the city of Phoenix Court of 67 Code Violations. He was uh, sentenced to 60 days in jail and was given a $12,180 fine. What was his problem? He was having some people come to his house and they were having Bible studies. He built a room onto the back of his property, which was legal for him to do. And they told him when he asked them, look, if that was a room with a pool table and a poker table in it, and I was having these friends come over to play pool or play poker, would I be in trouble? Would I be arrested? They said, absolutely not. You would not be. Uh, if you bring them over to watch Monday night football, you're not going to get in trouble. But if you bring them over and you have a Bible study on the premises, we're counting you as a church that's violating our zoning ordinances. You can't even do that in the privacy of your own home. Now that's Phoenix, Arizona. In Florida, a family is facing a fine for essentially the same thing. They're having people come into their home. It's not, by the way, I've checked out on both of these instances and done a little research. They weren't blocking traffic. Everyone was fitting in their driveway. It wasn't inconvenient for anyone else in the neighborhood. They were also fined for putting a small sign in their yard which says, if you need prayer, call this number. Now, I do not know exactly the religious persuasion of all of the folks involved, and I am sure that I would not agree with the religious beliefs of all the people that are involved, but I want to ask you a question, and I want you to stop and think about it with me for just a moment with great, serious, sober reflection. Are we on a slippery slope that if we don't try to put a stop to this is going to threaten more and more and more of our freedoms? And are we headed for a time when even events such as this would be shut down if they heard that we were speaking against homosexuality or something like abortion or something like that? I'm telling you, those who believe in Christianity are going to be in some of the worst trouble. I mentioned to you this military censorship of the Bible. Did you also know this caused quite a stir? The military came out with a list of number one groups or dangerous extremist groups to keep your eye on. Christianity was ranked above Al Qaeda. It was ranked above terrorists in Islam. And uh, this, again, was, uh, they tried to quietly uh, table this, but before they could get it all down, someone got a hold of the slides that they used in the presentation and made them available. And clear as, can, clear as a bell, I've got a picture of it. There is a slide from uh, a spokesman for the Pentagon who was speaking to this group, and uh, they have uh, Christianity listed as an enemy. Now... I don't know about you, but there are times when I hear certain politicians, and I'm talking on both sides of the aisle, when I hear certain people start espousing celebrities get on television and mock Christianity and ridicule God, and I see all of these people standing in opposition to the book I love, the book you love, the God I love, and I, I, I'll be frank with you, I had to preach some sermons to get myself out of the doldrums. I had to preach some sermons to lift me up out of the depths of depression. I went looking through the Bible to see, can God's people thrive in a world that's hostile to, hostile to him? And of course, I knew the answer already, but it did me some good to go back through the study. And so what I'd like to do for a few minutes tonight is go back through this study with you. And I want to notice that yes, God's people can thrive even in an environment that's not necessarily welcoming of God and God's people and those who believe in God and God's word. 
I want to start in Genesis chapter 39, Genesis 39, Joseph ends up in Egypt. We all know how he got there. His brothers sold him into slavery and the Bible says he was brought down to Egypt, Genesis 39, 1. In verse number two, we find this marvelous statement, the Lord was with Joseph and he was a prosperous man and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. Now, his master did not have the same religious views that Joseph had, and yet God found a way for Joseph to thrive, not just survive, but thrive in an environment that wasn't necessarily conducive to that. The Bible says in verse 3 that one of the things that helped Joseph was his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hand, and Joseph found grace in his sight and he served him and he made him overseer over his house and all that he had put into his hand. True or false, if you and I will make sure that no matter what happens in future years in this country, if you and I will make sure that God is first and foremost in our lives and we'll still live according to the precepts of his will as Joseph did, will people be able to see us and perhaps look more favorably upon us because of the kind of people that we are, yes or no? The Bible says in the book of Proverbs that when a man's ways please the Lord, even his enemies shall be at peace with him. And the Proverbs are not a guarantee 100% of the time because Jesus, of course, ways pleased God, but uh, his enemies were not at peace with him forever. They killed him. But that's the general rule is that you have a better chance of gaining the favor of your enemies when they can look at you. Cornelius was a Gentile that the Jews had tremendous respect for. And that was unusual for the Jews and the Gentiles to have respect for one another in any degree. But according to Acts 10.22, Cornelius had a good report even among the Jews. Why? He was a devout man. He feared God with all his house. He was a generous man. And he was the kind of man who prayed to God always. And when you're that kind of person, you have a lot better chance of being blessed because people can see that something is in you they wish was in them. And I'm saying that more and more folks will be looking for something as this world gets emptier and emptier. Christianity is going to be able to, like a shining beacon in the night, say to people who are tired of it all, there is hope, come over. And there's still hope for us to evangelize and to reach people. Now you, of course, know what happened to Joseph. After Joseph was blessed with so much, Potiphar trusted him so much according to verse 6 of Genesis 39. He left all that he had in Joseph's hand and there wasn't anything that he kept back from him. He didn't even have to calculate or keep up with it. He trusted Joseph that much. Joseph was a good person, well favored. Of course, Potiphar's wife enters the scene. She tries to seduce Joseph. Joseph says, how could I do this great wickedness against God? And by the way, that shows you the man he was. He's hundreds of miles from home. Who would ever know, Joseph? Who would ever know? I remember a preacher telling me on one occasion that the reason why he committed adultery and did the things that he did was because he had been so mistreated by the brethren. And I asked him, I said, Worse than Joseph? Oh, no, no. Could you be more mistreated than Joseph was by his brethren? And yet he didn't use that as an excuse and say, well, after all the pain and sorrow I've been through, I'm owed a little pleasure. No, he said, the greatest pleasure I have is living for God. And knowing that what I'm doing is what God wants me to be doing. And so he stands up for what's right. And what does it get him? He gets tossed into prison with the false accusation of rape. Now what? I thought that if you serve God, you'd always be blessed. No, we didn't say that you'd always have everything coming up roses. Notice, even after Joseph lands in prison in verse 20 of Genesis 39, would you read the next verse? But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. 
and the keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hand all the prisoners that were in the prison. And whatsoever they did there, he was the doer of it. He was the keeper of the prison, trusted him so much he didn't have to look to anything that was under his hand because the Lord was with him. And that which he did, the Lord made to prosper. Here's my question. If God could be with Joseph in a less than ideal environment, if God could be with Joseph when he was in prison for things that he had not done wrong, let me ask you if God forbid that day ever comes for our country and one of us preachers here lands in jail because we actually had the audacity to preach that those who are homosexuals shall not inherit the kingdom of God, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 and following. If that lands us in jail someday, is it over for us or can the providence of God still work things out to his glory and to our benefit? I have to keep that in mind. I don't know what's coming down the road. I'm not trying to be full of gloom and doom. In fact, In one sense, this lesson encourages me for this reason. We sometimes hear stories like I started out this message with, and we tend to think, well, the world has never been this bad. It's never been this bad. And then wait a minute. It was pretty bad in the days of Genesis chapter 6 and Noah's day, wasn't it? Yes. Every imagination of the thought of man's heart was only evil continually, and yet Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And we read on and we see so many examples of where it looked bleak and yet God was able to bring good things out of this. Now, let's fast forward to Genesis chapter 40 and notice that after Joseph has interpreted the dreams of the chief butler and the chief baker, the chief baker was hanged just as Joseph had interpreted. And the chief butler who had been asked by Joseph, hey, remember me please, he forgot Joseph. Two full years go by. Joseph's in prison. And uh, finally, Pharaoh has a dream. He can't figure it out. He wants an interpretation. And uh, the chief butler is like, oh, yes, I remember my fault today. Verse 9. And uh, Joseph is brought in. And I want you to notice in verse 14, then Pharaoh, Genesis 41, 14. Then Pharaoh sent and called Joseph. They brought him hastily out of the dungeon. He shaves himself and changes his raiment and came in unto Pharaoh. I want to look presentable because I am going before someone who is in a position of authority. Did God's people show proper respect for the office? They did. Did that mean he was going to compromise? No. As you read on, you'll see that Pharaoh tells him the dream. He interprets the dream. And he says, I would recommend you take a very wise man and put him in charge of gathering as much food as you can for the next seven years because uh, after that there are going to be seven years of famine. And so uh, Pharaoh says in Genesis chapter 41 and verse 38, can we find such a one as this is a man in whom the spirit of God is? Now, you and I are not going to be miraculously empowered as was Joseph to reveal dreams and interpretations and give miraculous revelations. But I want to ask you a question. Can the Spirit of God dwell in us richly? Can the Word of Christ dwell in us richly? Uh, Colossians 3.16. In the future, can people look at us and by seeing the Word that's... You remember what happened when Peter and John were called on the carpet, right? They perceived that they had been with Jesus. There's something about these two that really stands out. And I want it to be said of me, here's a man that you can see the Spirit of God in, in the sense that he's living by the directions of God's Holy Spirit, following the written word and doing what I can. And Joseph is appointed to what position? Notice verse 42, Pharaoh took his ring off his hand, put it upon Joseph, arrayed him in vestures of fine linen, put a gold chain about his neck, made him ride in the second chariot which he had, And what a story from the pit to the palace. Joseph has been raised up to a position that I'm sure he never dreamed that he would. Wait a minute. He had dreamed. He had dreamt about some of these things. And you'll notice that the Bible says in verse 46, Joseph was 30 years old when he stood before Pharaoh, king of Egypt. He went out from the presence of Pharaoh and he's over all the land of Egypt. And then the brothers show up. And Joseph, according to chapter 42, 6, is the governor over the land. And then you get over to chapter 44, and you'll notice in verse number uh, 
Make it, let's hurry on to chapter 45. Verse seven, this is what Joseph reveals. God sent me before you to preserve you a posterity in the earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So now it was not you that sent me here, but God. Whoa. Is God still on the throne and still in control of this universe? Yes. And when things don't turn out quite the way I'd wish they had, you know what I have to tell myself? God knows what he's doing. And he can remove men from the throne. He can put them on the throne. And he can do it in his own good time when it's the right time. And I have to trust him. And I have to believe that whatever happens in the future, the providence of God will see me through. And I will be blessed if I follow his will and continue to be loyal to him. In fact, uh, the Bible tells us that uh, Jacob now ends up in Egypt with the, with the brothers, with the boys. And uh, talk about a blessing and providence. The land of Egypt, according to Genesis 47 and verse 6, was given to Joseph to choose a spot. You pick the best spot for your family to live in, Joseph, God was taking care of Joseph and his family. And look at the respect. Even though Pharaoh was not a believer in God as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, you'll notice that in Genesis 47 and verse 10, Jacob blessed Pharaoh and went out from before Pharaoh. And Joseph also nourished his father and took care of them in verse 12. And then you'll notice in chapter 50 very quickly, Joseph, what do you think about this whole situation? Well, I'm going to bury my father, verse 7, and Pharaoh lets him go back home and do that. And then Joseph himself is going to die. And he says in verse 20 to his brothers, he said, look, you, you thought you were doing evil to me. God meant it to good. Can God take a bad situation and make something come out of it good for his glory? Yes or no? I have to remember that. I need that message right now in my lifetime. And I don't know exactly why things are happening the way that they're happening and how this moral downslide is all going to work out and whether it's going to finally jolt us into awareness or whether we're going to get, I don't know how far the iniquity meter is. Do you remember God said he wasn't <coughs> going to destroy the, give the land of Canaan until the people, according to Genesis 15, why? Why were, was he not going to just give them the land right then and there? He says the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. It finally reached the full level and God did something about it. How far is the American iniquity meter? I don't know. But I know this, that even if we reach the point of full, God can take care of his people here or hereafter. And I want you to please observe that in Genesis chapter 50 and verse 24, Joseph, how confident are you that God's on the throne and in charge? He said, well, I'm dying, yes, but God will surely visit you. How, are you faithful, Joseph, to believe that God's still going to take care of his people? Yes. In fact, he saw the problems coming to his people before they ever came. He said, God will surely visit you, bring you out of this land to the land that he swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. God's going to keep his promises. Now turn over to Exodus 1 for another example of how God's people cannot just survive but thrive. In less than ideal circumstances. Exodus 1, verse 7, after Joseph died, the children of Israel have become fruitful. They've increased abundantly. They've multiplied. They've waxed exceeding mighty. The land is just filled with them. And Pharaoh, a new Pharaoh, one that didn't know Joseph, says, we've got to do something about this, verse number 8 and following. He says, the children of Israel, are, they're more and mightier than we are. We've got to do something. So... Let's really bring affliction. Verse 11, they set over them taskmasters to afflict them with their burdens and made them work harder than they'd ever worked before. Watch verse 12. But the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew. And they were grieved because of the children of Israel. Let me ask you a question. If more and more affliction is coming our way, does that mean the church can't grow anymore? What does Acts 8 tell us? 
The great persecution scattered the disciples from Jerusalem. And what did that lead to? The seed being sown in all these different places. And the church was multiplying. A, a multitude were turning to the Lord according to Acts 11, 19 to 21. And so we see the absolute conviction that we have to just keep preaching when it gets dark and, and see the light. <laughs> we know that we can do this. And that we can find our way through if God is on our side. Who can be against us? Listen to Romans 8.31. If God be for us, what's the rest of it? Who can be against us? And the answer is no one can be against us. Those Hebrew midwives were able to thwart the plan to kill all of the male children. And you keep on reading in the Old Testament and you see that there were individuals such as those four men who went to Babylon... And the light came on. <laughs> Those four men, Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah, and Daniel. He said, I remember Daniel, but I'm not sure about this Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And I think, quite frankly, that's unfortunate. We know them more by their Babylonian slave names, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But I think if you'd ask them which one they'd prefer to be called, I think they'd probably like their original given names. Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, and Daniel. You've got to eat this stuff, our stuff. You can't eat your food. Now, I want you to notice in Daniel chapter 1, the respect and yet the conviction. And we sometimes think, well, if I could just talk for five minutes to some of these people that are in charge, I'd let them have a piece of my mind. And, then, and you know what? I understand the human tendency to feel that way, but let me ask you a question is it important for us to go to these biblical examples and say, hey, wait a minute, how did they do it? And what mentality and attitude should I have? Shouldn't I combine conviction that's rock solid with respect and Christian demeanor? That's what I have to do. Now, I'm not saying we can never be righteously indignant, but we do have to keep it in perspective. Daniel, you've been told that you're going to have to eat what the king of Babylon gives you to eat and watch his reaction. In verse 11 of Daniel 1, then said Daniel to Melzar, whom the prince of the eunuch said, said over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, he said, prove thy servants, I beseech thee. I'm showing respectful language. Sometimes people will say, your honor, if I may, your honor, if, may it please the court, what are, what's all that about? I'm respecting your position as being in charge but I do have a request I think is justified to make. Daniel, are you going to show respect to those in charge of you? Yes, I, I'm, I'm beseeching that I have a request to make of you. Daniel, are you going to back down? No, I've already, verse 8, Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore, he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. It starts with a request, not a picket line. He starts in the right way. Now, let me ask you a question. Based on what you know about Daniel in Daniel chapter 6, if the answer had come back, no, you're going to have to eat what the king gives you, what would Daniel have done? Are you serious? Okay, 10 minutes, wow, okay. What would Daniel have done? Can the lights go out again so he can't see his watch? <laughs> what would Daniel have done? If the ruling had come back, you have to eat the king's meat. Well, when the ruling came, you can't pray. What did Daniel do? He prayed. I'm absolutely convinced, based on the conviction in Daniel 1.8, that if Daniel had been told, no, you have to eat this stuff, he would have said, well, you'll have to punish me and put me to death before I do. And there comes a time when you and I have to draw that line. Don't preach anymore in the name of Jesus, you apostles. Well, whether it's right in the sight of men to do that or not, we know it's right in the sight of God, and we cannot but preach in the name of Jesus. We ought to obey God rather than men, Acts 5.29. And when you read about the uh, Daniel of Daniel chapter 2, interpreting Nebuchadnezzar's dream, I wish we had time to look at all this. I'll just give you a, a few glimpses here, and then you can fill in the blanks later on. I want you to notice that when he heard that every one of the wise men was going to be put to death because they couldn't tell Nebuchadnezzar what his dream was, much less give him the interpretation, Daniel says to Arioch, the captain, look, uh, why is this decree so hasty? 
can you bring me before the king? I can interpret his dream by God's power. And notice that he went, verse 18, or verse 17, to the others, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, and he said, verse 18, desire mercies of the God of heaven. When you're in a foreign land, and it seems more and more like we Christians are living in a foreign land, doesn't it, as far as those who share any of the same values that we do, when you're in a foreign land, you have to go constantly to the God of heaven and ask his help and constantly pray to him, and that's what those four did. And because those four did that, I want you to notice back in chapter 1 and verse 20 what it said, uh, verse 17, as for these four children, Daniel 1, 17, God gave them knowledge and skill in all learning and wisdom. Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. And uh, verse number 20, in all matters of wisdom and understanding, he found, the king found Daniel and his folks <clears throat> 10 times better than all the magicians and the astrologers in all of his realm. And Daniel keeps on prospering and growing. And he says uh, in Daniel chapter 2, look at verse 29. He says... As for thee, O king, we would say, Mr. President. As for thee, O king, verse 29, verse 31, thou, O king, saw and beheld a great image. Verse 37, thou, O king, Mr. President, you're a, you're a king of kings. The God of heaven has given you a kingdom, power, and strength, and glory. But he says your kingdom's going to fall. He doesn't mince words. We sometimes think, I can't tell the truth without being disrespectful. That's not true. I can't tell the truth without being disrespectful. Well, that's not true. Can you tell the truth and be respectful? Yes, can you be respectful and not tell the truth? That's the other extreme that people go to. They'll be very respectful in the way they act towards someone, but they never get around to the truth they need to hear. The thing I love about Daniel, look over at Daniel chapter four. When he's confronting Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel four, look at what he says to him in verse 27. Wherefore, O king, let my counsel be acceptable unto thee. I'm asking you to please listen to what I'm saying. Please listen to this now. Break off thy sins by righteousness and thine iniquities by showing mercy to the poor. And that will, pro that will perhaps lengthen the tranquility of your kingdom and your peace. He does not hold back from what Nebuchadnezzar needs to hear, but he does approach him with respect, but he does approach him with conviction. And look, if you will, please, at verse number 32. He said, they're going to drive you, Nebuchadnezzar, into the field, and you're going to be there until you know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men and giveth it to whomsoever he will. I want to ask you tonight, does the Most High still rule in the kingdoms of men? Is God still on the throne? Yes, he is, and if he is, is he going to still take care of his people one way or another? Yes, but does that mean we're all going to live all the time? I love the attitude of Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Go back to chapter three. You remember, you see that image? You, you're going to bow to it. No, I'm not. Yes, you're going to bow to it, or you're going to be thrown into a fiery furnace. We won't bow. We're not going to bend, and you know the rest. They wouldn't burn, right? And as you read Daniel chapter three, this Nebuchadnezzar is so arrogant. Verse 14, is it true? O oh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, do not you serve my gods nor worship the golden image which I've set up? I tell you what, I'm going to give you one more chance. I'll give you one more chance to do what you should have done the first time. And if you don't do it, then verse 15, last part of the verse, you'll be cast the same hour into the midst of a burning fiery furnace. And who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able. He is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. Notice there's the respect, but there's the conviction. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, we will not serve thy gods. We won't worship the golden image which you've set up. Period. End of story. Do with us what you will, but we're not backing down from God's word. So, <laughs> let them do what they will. 
I pray to God we can have a renewal and a revival and an awakening in this country of the standard that everyone ought to be living by. But if we can't get that done and Christianity becomes more and more a matter of a criminal activity in the eyes of our government, if that is the case, then I pray we'll be able to overcome it. I, I want to say this as I close out. The apostles, of course, <clears throat> were beaten for their faith. And do you remember what they did after they were beaten? Acts chapter 5 and verse 41. They departed from the presence of the council, what? Rejoicing. I don't know what's coming or how soon it's coming. I shudder and sometimes think about the world my children may live in in years to come. But I don't want to be full of gloom and doom. I want to end on this note of hope. Is it true or is it false that throughout the scriptures, and we've only touched the hem of the garment, is it true or is it false that God has repeatedly been there to bless his people even when the government under which they live was not very welcoming of Christianity? 14 of the 15 Roman emperors homosexuals, and yet the book of Romans written to a thriving church in Rome. Yes, we can still be God's people. He can still bless us. Even when times are tough, let's trust God and pray, pray, pray that we don't ever get to that point. But if we do, let us be like those men and say, our God is able, we trust him.